And now it is my pleasure to hand over to our Master of Ceremony, who will officially introduce our speaker today, Director of the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center, Mary Kluck. Thanks, Amdu, and thank you for the lovely introductory session. It's wonderful to be with everybody. Um, but in particular, I'd like to thank Mdu and the entire team at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, particularly Tally Nates, the director, for partnering with the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center on this special event this evening. And thank you too to our small team at the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center for your passion and commitment to everything we do. This evening, as Mdu has mentioned, and I'm going to repeat some of it just for the benefit of those who are joining and have just joined, we're hosting a conversation with Dr. Daniel Lee, the author of his book, The SS Officer's Armchair in Search of a Hidden Life. And to once again mention that it's published by Penguin Random House. And I would like to thank Ne'ilwe from the publishers for her assistance with this event. Um, this excellent book is available online through Take A Lot, but it's also easily available for all of us at exclusive books. And we certainly encourage you to spend the next few wintry days curled up with it in your hands. I will make a few further remarks and introduce Daniel more formally in a moment, but I thought I'd just start this evening with the review, the review of the SS officer's armchair in search of a hidden life from Professor Christopher Browning. He, Christopher Browning, is the Frank Porter Graham Professor of History Emeritus of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill best known to many of us as the author of the groundbreaking book, Ordinary Men. And Professor Browning wrote, in Daniel Lee's The SS Officer's Armchair, the story of an utterly obscure and ordinary SS officer recovered through extraordinary research is embedded in the illuminating context of upper middle-class German society and family life in the first half of the 20th century. The result is a fascinating combination of social history, family drama, and ingenious detective work. Couldn't get a better um, recommendation, but more accurate description either. Um, oopsie. Just to uh, remind everybody of Mdu's suggestion that everybody keeps their um, devices on mute while the session is taking place um, will be easy for everybody. Thank you. It's such a privilege for all of us to continue our growth and learning in these difficult times. We're delighted to welcome trustees from both centers, our wonderfully committed volunteers, and many, many special friends. We're aware that load shedding, sadly, has imp imp impacted on people's ability to join us, but please be assured we will certainly share the recording. Our centers are places of education and memory. And during this pandemic, we've been inspired at how we've been able to connect with schools in the online space on so many levels and have been incredibly busy with many projects and these public events. In the KwaZulu-Natal province, we are somewhat behind other provinces with regard to the COVID-19 virus. So the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide uh, Center has since yesterday started to open by appointment only, and obviously under strict health protocols and guidelines. Hopefully this will proceed as expected, and they already are experiencing great interest and, and visitors, which is exciting. And we'll work closely with our colleagues in Johannesburg to help inform us how we'll proceed with opening our center in Durban as well, in the next couple of months. In the meantime, we continue to provide you, our most valued friends, opportunities like this evening to learn together. Welcome, one and all. I'll now introduce Dr. Daniel Lee a little more formally. Um, he is a senior lecturer in modern history at Queen Mary University in London. He's a specialist in the history of Jews in France and North Africa during the Second World War and completed his doctorate at none other than Oxford University. He's the author of Petown's Jewish Children, a BBC Radio 3 New Generation thinker. Daniel is a regular broadcaster on radio. 
so I continue to assure you you're in for a treat this evening. He's talking to us from his home in London. Welcome and thank you so much, Daniel. We're excited to have your book on the shelves of exclusive books in South Africa and to be able to, through these extraordinary times, find a silver lining and connect with the author at his home in London. Thank you so much for being with us and for taking this opportunity to share with this audience um, insights into not only the book, but your journey in creating it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mdu. Thank you, Tally. This is, uh, it's such an honor. My first trip to Durban. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. We are more than sorry. We're more than sorry. I found the book absolutely gripping, full of important content and authentic research, and yet so accessible to the reader. So let's start off and let's hear your voice, which is what everybody's come to, to hear. The book title is The SS Officer's Armchair. So Daniel, unpack a little bit for us. Who is the SS Officer and what armchair are you writing about? Thank you, thank you, Mary. So, right, in terms of um, the story, it's one of these stories that as a historian, we, we often dream of. It's the story coming to us rather than us going out and looking for something. So having finished my, uh, my PhD that you mentioned, I moved to Florence in 2011 to begin some new research. And shortly after arriving in, in the city, um, I, I hosted a, a small gathering at my place and, and for the various people who I had, I had met. And one of the people who, who was there came up to me and said, oh, I'm so looking forward to meeting you because you're a historian of the Second World War. And there's something that just happened to my mother that I hope you can help me with. And that was immediately rather odd to me, the fact that something had just happened. Because, you know, usually with the Second World War, people want to tell me a story about a grandfather or an aunt. Nothing has ever just happened. So that immediately made me quite interested. And she, she told me this remarkable story about how her mother had just taken this old armchair to be reupholstered. Uh, she, she was, um, the, the chair maker was doing the work in Amsterdam. She'd left the chair with uh, the chair maker. I think we have a photo somewhere, which hopefully we can share. Um, but if not, I can describe it. Um, and she basically uh, went back after a few days and the man doing the work was very angry with her. And he said, well, what is this? I don't do work for Nazis or their families. And so she was just totally stunned, totally bewildered. You know, what are you talking about? This is an armchair, for goodness sake. I... And he proceeded to, to show her all these documents that he had discovered sewn into the cushion of the lining of this armchair. And he's like, he, he, is this your father? Like, who is this? I don't understand. And the woman was totally stunned. She had no idea who this man was. He was certainly was no relative of hers. It turned out that she had actually purchased the armchair. She hadn't inherited it or anything. She was a student in Prague in the 1960s and she just needed some, some cheap items, you know, like everybody as a student to, to sort of furnish her student digs. And she fell in love with this chair. And then in the 1980s, when certain families were allowed to leave communist Czechoslovakia, she took it with her to Amsterdam. So she'd had it for, for 40 years. The kids had grown up on it. It, it was in, the, the, the cushion was in tatters and she just decided to get it remade. And then what happened next was the girl just wanted to know absolutely everything about the documents because every single document that was discovered inside, all covered with Nazi swastikas, everything belonged to one man. It was all in this one man's name, Robert Griesinger. I think we might have a, 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 another picture uh, coming up uh, to, to show you. So everything was in this one man's name. And so she came up to me in Florence and she sort of said, well, who is this man? And how did his documents end up hidden inside my armchair? That was something that she was really, uh, it was the mystery that she wanted to solve. And that, that's how the story started for me. What an incredible start to a story, but that was literally the start, as you say, in 2011. Why did you decide to dedicate many, many years to discovering who Robert Griesinger was? What was the significance to you? And how did you begin to think about going about it? 
That's a great question. So I feel uh, at the start, I think, you know, I, I had finished, I was finishing my first book again, which was on the Second World War. And it just dawned on me that uh, when I was holding these documents for the first time that, yeah, I know about the Second World War. And a lot of people also know about the Second World War. But when it comes to sort of thinking about the Nazis and the Third Reich, how much do we actually know about so many of the actors that were involved? Of course, we know the people at the top. We know people inside of Hitler's uh, cabinet, Hitler, Himmler, Heydrich. But when we, when we start to sort of delve a bit deeper, it, start, it's, it, it dawned on me that a lot of these people's name, not just names, but you know, actual sort of day-to-day activities had become somehow lost sort of after the war so many there were so few trials in Germany um, and elsewhere in in Europe for for people who had committed so many atrocities so many people blamed the people at the top and that 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 was always you know I was always so fascinated by that I always wanted to know a little bit more about who were these millions of nameless and faceless people that actually did so much work for uh, the Third Reich and actually made the regime possible. So that's, in a sense, what I was trying to do. Look, I was trying to look for these enablers and trying to return texture and agency. So in a sense that Griesinger, in this photo, who, who, who I've written my book about, you know, how could he stand in for the roles of thousands and thousands of other people? That's what I was trying to do in this book. So, so as you say, we know about the people at the top. And uh, Robert Griesinger was a lawyer in the Third Reich. Maybe you will speak a little bit more about the bureaucrats, such as, and these people that you were particularly interested in, their lawyers, accountants, even doctors, I guess. What was, um, the, I guess we might use the word or the expression to quote Christopher Browning of ordinary men. What was their role? in the Holocaust and in this, in, this, in this tragic history? Well, someone like Griesinger, um, as, as I discovered as I was doing the work, you know, he, he really did fit this mold that so many Holocaust historians have, have sort of identified as the people who would be susceptible to um, obtaining uh, positions in the Third Reich. He was born at exactly the right time so what I mean by that is he was born between 1900 and 1910. He fit this generation, this war youth generation, the sort of people who were far too young to have fought in the First World War because they were children. But by goodness, you know, it was the key event that marked their lives. You know, by the time Germany hadn't been invaded during the First World War. So for a lot of these people, they really thought that, you know, Germany was going to win the First World War and, that you know, things would, would be very rosy. So, so the defeat, the total defeat, the humiliation that came with the end of the First World War was something that, it, it was a real watershed moment in the life of someone like Griesinger and people of his generation. He came from a very middle-class militaristic family. Um, he was Protestant, he was well-educated, he attended the best schools, the best universities. When it came, when the Nazis uh, seized power, or, or when the Nazis came to power, you know, he was somebody who he, he took like he took to the Nazi system like a duck to water. It didn't take much for someone like him and people of his um, of his background to be drawn to it. I mean, um, so I think we're seeing some pictures. Uh, um, so so yeah, so he was part, he was as we said. So he was a lawyer. He got his degree. Um, from a very right-wing university, a nationalist university. No Jews were allowed at his university. Um, and for, for, you know, for thousands of other civil servants, lawyers, doctors, uh, it, was, it, it wasn't difficult to become somehow involved in the Nazi party, in the system, even if they weren't members. And perhaps we can talk about that in a moment. I feel that we, I'm jumping ahead here uh, with my answer. Sure. So, well, just going back to, to r- rather uh, Robert Griesinger in particular, and what might have influenced him specifically, I was fascinated to read in the book of his heritage, which is steeped in the South, 
in the US and that his father was born in the US because there's a perception that Nazis come from a long German lineage. And his grandparents, in fact, were um, people who enslaved others. Yes. Uh, could you elaborate a little on your thoughts on how this might have influenced his worldview? Mm. So, so that was a, a quite a turning point for me when I was in the archives one day and I, I had to pull out his, his, uh, his ancestry from a file. Like, so, as, as you know, and so many people in the room tonight know, so much was destroyed at the end of the Second World War, so many documents. It was really, it was, it was one of the hardest things for me writing this book was actually finding, the vo finding voices, finding documents because of, you know, Allied bombings had destroyed so much. Uh, and then of course the Nazis themselves uh, burnt so many of their own records. So to trace the life of one individual proved very, very tough, but very fortunately, I, I managed to track down his relatives uh, in Stuttgart, uh, which is the town uh, that he was from and he grew up and he lived his life. Um, and I was able to get, after, after, after meeting them and showing them that I was a serious historian, that, you know, they were of course very wary of me at first asking so many questions about a relative. Um, but they very, eventually they kindly agreed to like show me uh, personal papers. And, and it turned out that one of the documents which was really key to this book was his mother's diary. His mother kept a diary and she wrote every single day since he was born. We see an example of that here in the background. That's Robert standing up as a toddler <clears throat> with his mother and, and his little brother, Albert, um, in that photo. So that's how I was able to get like a real sense into the family, into their background, into their life, into their worldview, and later into their anti-Semitism. But it did come as a shock to me to find out that his father, wasn't, had not been born in Germany, and that actually had been born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and it was something that really had left a mark on this man. Just going to Griesinger's house today in Stuttgart, for example, I was able to see as soon as I got there, these enormous columns, these pillars coming out of the ground, like no other house in Stuttgart. And when I looked at the blueprints, the architectural blueprints from the 1920s of this house, it had been modeled precisely on a Southern Louisiana uh, plantation home. This is exactly what the family wanted to remember. They wanted to maintain this link with their Southern past. So again, I had to go to Louisiana and trace the family and see um, what sorts of things, uh, what, sort, what I could about uh, his ancestors there. And yeah, I did discover that in every generation, his family arrived in the 1720s and in every generation, various, uh, relatives, ancestors, men and women, had owned enslaved people, including his grandmother, um, Lena, who he was very close with and had moved uh, to Germany, Germany in the late 19th century. And of course, brought with her so many ideas and, and, and influences of the American South. Fascinating. Um, I am going to ask you a question, maybe in a, in, in a couple of minutes, about this um, journey of discovery and research, because we'd love to hear some of the places it took you to. The way you describe how you came across the identity of greasing his father in the archive makes it sound like it was just you walk into the archive and there it is waiting for you. And I mean, all of us know how difficult just to research the testimony of a single survivor in our own cities. And this book has been how many years, uh, Daniel, of research, and maybe give us an insight into one anecdote at the outset of how difficult this journey was. Although it never comes across as difficult in the book, I can only imagine what it must have taken in terms of tenacity to go from place to place to literally look in phone books to find people. No, that's, ex that's exactly it. Um, so there was, um, yeah, it took about four or five years of research before I began to actually sit down and write anything. So it did take a lot of time. I had, as I said, I went to Louisiana to trace his background. And then of course, archives in Germany, in, um, in Prague, because that's the city where he was during the Second World War. Um, and in France as well, because he had been stationed in France at the beginning of World War II. So lots of archival visits, lots of 
you know, very frustrating dead ends, which is normal as historians. We, we're used to archival research, just sitting there looking through boxes, arriving in an archive and spending days and days and not finding a single relevant thing. That, that does happen sometimes and it's deeply frustrating. And it, like you said, it's not a question of just turning up and saying, oh, hello, please can I have some information on Robert Griesinger? Like, you can't do that in an archive unless you're working on somebody very famous or somebody, an, in, in, in the case of the Nazis, somebody who was a, uh, a known uh, Nazi killer, perpetrator, somebody like that. For any of these, what I call ordinary Nazis, there are no individual sort of files that exist in, in the same way. It's a lot of sort of sluggish work. So to give an example, in the SS, um, so I discovered quite early on in Prague from the archives that he had been a member of the SS, and that took me to the archives in Berlin, the SS archives in Berlin. Um, and I knew that that would be very difficult because so much had been destroyed. Only a third of the SS archives actually remain. And I was able to discover um, information about him there. But again, that was, that was very, very lucky. I discovered, for example, in those archives that he had been a father. So if we, if, if, if we, if, um, if we return to one of the earlier pictures, I'm sorry to, to, to make us all uh, jump around a bit, but we, we see in the early passport photo, which when I first discovered his passport, I, I thought he was a bachelor. I thought he wasn't married. I didn't know he had any children. There was no evidence in his personal papers, you know, under the names of children or wife or whatever, there's nothing mentioned. But when I was in the SS archives, it was there that I discovered he had been married. He had gone through an extraordinary process to even try to get married. The SS were not going to let him marry anybody. On the contrary, it was a deeply um, difficult uh, affair for him to even get married, which, as you can see from this photo, ended rather well for him because they did eventually grant their permission. But it was a long, long drawn out process where his wife had to be tested for all sorts of things to make sure she had no Jewish ancestry or anything else that might have been sort of perceived as racially undesirable. And of course, that she would be able to have four healthy, beautiful Aryan children. All of this had to be checked uh, by the Nazi authorities, and just like they did on every single SS wife. So when I discovered that he had children, two daughters, I, I wanted to talk to them. Of course, I thought, okay, they might still be alive. Um, but just like it is with when you're doing, when you're tracing ordinary people in history, it's very difficult to trace the we, the women's line because so many women get get uh, you know missed out in history because you're constantly tracing the male name. So in this instance, I had no idea what his daughter's married names were. It was completely impossible uh, to find this kind of information. So it was. Eventually, I was so frustrated that I just sat there with the phone book to Stuttgart and I just phoned every single person with his last name in Stuttgart until, event I mean, everyone was hanging up on me. They thought I was trying to sell them something or I was a crazy British, I don't know what, but eventually somebody said, oh yes, that was my father's brother, Robert Griesinger. How can I help you? So it was thanks to uh, this opportunity of meeting a relative who happened to be the nephew that I was able to meet other members of the family, find out the daughter's names, and I was able to take things from there. Fascinating. And um, just going to that point about him being a member of the SS, and I must admit that prior to reading your book, my understanding of an SS member was a little different. I understood that they would don the black uniform that we saw in the photograph previously, um, every day and be engaged exclusively in SS matters. Um, can you elaborate on what membership of the SS actually means? And right. What it meant in Robert Griesinger's it, life? Yeah, it's, it's so different to whoever, it, it, it really varied enormously. So the picture here is not actually an SS uniform. That's his army uniform. That's the uniform he would have been wearing. Perhaps we'll get to that in a few minutes, but that's the uniform he would have been wearing as an everyday soldier. So that's actually, it's really interesting because just like you, I, before I even began thinking about this question, I believed that the SS was something like the kind of organization we see in the films. Some, so it's a group of, you know, men dressed in 
always dressed in black SS uniform. And their sole mission really is to track down Jews, communists, de the social Democrats, round them up and, uh, you know, uh, either torture them or take them away to camps or, or whatever. But really, the more and more I sort of investigated the SS, I realized that that was, n that was only the case for a minority of SS members, the people, the concentration camp guards, the people who were paid to be in the SS and it, it, for whom it was a full-time job. For someone like Griesinger and for thousands of SS men like Griesinger, SS, SS um, activities, SS participation varied enormously. It was, for someone like Griesinger, it was a, it was a way to advance his career. He couldn't join the Nazi party because by the time he decided that he wanted to make a place for himself in Hitler's Germany, it was too late. The Nazis had said, oh, sorry, no more members now. So he found himself in September 1933 without any way of advancing his career. But fortunately, his background was such that it came in extremely useful for him. He had this amazing PhD, he had the Protestant background, the, um, the, the upper middle class background. He, he, he was able to join the SS without even being a member of the Nazi party. And that's, that's really what he did. And from then on, it was a question of him sort of, it depended on, on the circumstances. Some years he was very active in the SS. He would go to the meetings, he would don the uniform, he would attend rallies, uh, for example, in Munich um, or even in Stuttgart. But some, at other times when his career was going quite well, he would take a step back from the SS and, and he, he wouldn't be promoted and he probably only attended meetings about once a month on, on a Tuesday or on a Sunday. So it wasn't this sort of full-time position which took over his entire life. He dipped in and out depending on his various circumstances and just as thousands and thousands of other SS men did at that time. Interestingly, at the, on the eve of war, as war broke out in 1935, um, explain a little bit about where Griesinger found himself in terms of his, you know, commitment to the party, but in fact, what his involvement uh, in, in, in ultimately ended up being in, in relation to this uniform as well. Yeah, so, so Griesinger was, um, he had, so many of his friends from Stuttgart, his very close working colleagues, they, with whom he worked every day in the 1930s, he actually was working at the Gestapo in the mid-1930s until 1937. And he worked as a lawyer at the Gestapo in Stuttgart in this enormous building, which still exists. It wasn't bombed in the center of Stuttgart, the Hotel Silber. And he shared an office with, um, with some very well-known figures from, uh, for, people, for people who know about uh, the Holocaust. Uh, somebody like Walter Starlecker, who it only dawned on me recently when talking to Tally Nates. Actually, a lot of South Africans might know this name because of the, the role that Starlecker played in the destruction of the Jews living in the Baltic. Uh, people of Latvian heritage, for example. Starlecker was entirely responsible for that. And Starlecker was very close to Griesinger. Starlecker signed documents to say that Griesinger's wife would make a very good SS bride. Like the two were, were, knew each other extremely well. People like Starlecker and the other lawyers in his office, they decided to get more involved in the SS as a profession. And that's, that meant that by the time war broke out in 1939, these guys were either, had, they either had very good jobs in the SS, either in Berlin or elsewhere, or they had very good desk jobs, office jobs. Whereas Griesinger, he did not find himself in that position. He hadn't bet on the SS horse, so to speak. He found himself as a lawyer in Stuttgart, actually just outside of Stuttgart at that time. And so he was called up for military service, just like any other soldier. And he was devastated about this. Just reading his correspondence from the time, from 3940, shows that he is, the only thing on his mind is how to get a good job. He doesn't want to be wearing this army uniform. He wants to be behind a desk and he wants to be somewhere like Prague, somewhere, somewhere where he sees himself, somewhere with a future. But instead, he, ha he happens to go, he's sent to France to fight 
on the Western Front there against, uh, first he invades Belgium and, and then ends up in France. And he spends his summer in 1940 in France, getting ready to invade Great Britain, because of course, in 1940, everybody knew that uh, that Germany was going to win the war. It was, it was, you know, only a crazy person would think that Germany wasn't going to win the war in June, uh, July 1940. Hitler was supreme across Europe at that time. There was no USSR, no America involved in the war. So it was only a matter of time before Germany invaded Britain. So that's exactly what, you know, people like Griesinger and his, the men in his unit were thinking uh, at that time. That didn't happen, as we know. They didn't make an invasion a successful invasion of Britain. And then we find a year later in June 1941, Griesinger is still in the army. He hasn't managed to find a better place for himself. And in June 1941, his unit begins to head east. And that's quite, that's another turning point in his life when he starts heading towards the USSR. There are, as you say, in the, the book is full of these incredible stories of his journey and the way you describe it is remarkable. I wondered if you want to, because I just wanted to let the audience know that I'll ask you a couple more questions and then we're going to open the floor and Tally will facilitate questions from the floor that people can put in the chat and um, any other questions um, to engage further in this fascinating uh, topic. You, this journey that you took allowed you to meet some fascinating people. Um, can you spend some time maybe speaking about greasing his family members, mm. especially how you came to Robert's daughters and their response to you? Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. I would never have been able to write this book without the help of his family. Absolutely no way. Um, I... His, um, as I said, his nephew was the key to the story. His nephew allowed me access to the family house, which hadn't been bombed severely. So here's a photo we see here of Robert Griesen holding his baby daughter, Jutta, with his parents um, in the garden of the family house in, in Stuttgart. So that is a, that's a photo from probably 1938, 39. Um, Eventually, I managed to track, as I said, I, I managed to track down the family. They were very supportive. They gave me access to so many primary documents, the, like I said, diaries, letters, the kind of thing every historian dreams of having. Um, and then eventually, I managed to um, meet his daughters. And it was a, you know, a big decision for me about you know, whether or not I was going to meet them and um, how that would influence the book and my writing. But I decided to meet them. And then over, over several years, I got to know them more and more and they opened up to me. And of course, at first they were slightly wary and that they wondered why I was asking all these questions. Um, but what was so amazing was how little they actually knew about his life, his actual um, role in the Nazi party. They, had abs or they said they had absolutely no idea that he had ever been involved with the party. He joined in 1937, he was in the SS, he worked at the Gestapo, none of this they knew. So the kind of information I wanted from them, you know, you know any basic information, they, they, would, they were able to provide very, very easily. Um, it then, after I would ask my questions to his daughter, so one is living in Switzerland today and the other one is still in Germany, we had this very curious moment where once I'd finished asking my questions, they would start to ask me questions. They were very, very curious to know what I had discovered about their father because for so many years, I mean, it doesn't, it won't ruin the book for me to say because I say this very early on that Griesinger died in 1945 in Prague. Um, that is not a spoiler in any way. What's interesting is the way in which his daughters grew up without a father. This is something which marked them for the rest of their lives. The way that in throughout the late 40s, early 50s, they tried their hardest to ask their mother and other relatives questions about their father. They wanted to know about their father, but they were constantly told to be quiet or, you know, it's not appropriate or it was a taboo. That's the word they kept mentioning to me, that the, the subject of their father was taboo. So by the time I came along, all these years later, oh, that's a wonderful photo. This I found in a in a drawer 
in their house, in one of the houses in Stuttgart, a family photo uh, from Prague in 1943, um, once the family had left Stuttgart and had settled in Prague. Anyway, so, so one of the daughters, the one you see there, the older daughter in the white coat, she, oh, they're both wearing white coats, the one holding, uh, the one to the left of the photo, the older daughter, she, she retained memories of her father. She was eight when he died. She was a real daddy's girl. And it, it really marked her entire life, the absence and the loss of her father at such a young age. Whereas for the younger daughter, it was different. She didn't have memories of her father. She was reliant upon the stories she had heard from other people. So, so yeah, it was, it was a, it was a, it really was not something I had been prepared for as a historian to have this kind of dynamic with his daughters. But I think it's a, having spent so much time with them and the fact that they were so open to me, I think it's a much better book because of that, because of their involvement. Which is, um, as you say, you couldn't have anticipated it, but just as well you did have, make the decision to make contact with them because they added so much. Um, it's interesting that they, you know, didn't know the role their father played. I'm interested in your thoughts about Griesinger as a Holocaust perpetrator and how much he knew about what was going on in the regime. I mean, look, Griesinger, however much people said after the war that, you know, oh, it wasn't us, we were following orders or we didn't really know. You know, you just look at a career of someone like Robert Griesinger and they knew exactly what was going on. The archive leaves no doubt about it. The guy worked at the Gestapo. So, okay, maybe he, he was a lawyer at the Gestapo. Fair enough, I accept that. So maybe he was not the person physically rounding up the Jews or the communists or the social Democrats or any other of these so-called enemies, but he was upstairs at his typewriter sending the orders for these people to be cut, to be brought to the Hotel Silver, the Gestapo headquarters in Stuttgart, and for them to be tortured in his building. And one of the first things I discovered in Stuttgart when I went was the number of elderly people today, people in their 90s, who refused to walk past that building because of the stories they heard as children of the torture that took place in the basement. So he's upstairs typing away at his desk and he knows all too well what is going away in his basement. He knew exactly what was going on when his unit was invading the Soviet Union in June and July 1941. He knew that ordinary soldiers were not taking part in these so-called gentlemanly wars against the Red Army, which even historians thought had been the case for so many years, that the, the German army would invade and you know, civilians were just ignored and that there would be some kind of battle. This is nonsense. We know just from looking at his unit, the number of Jews living in Ukraine in June and July 1941 who were massacred by members of his unit. And then by the time we get to Prague in 1943, 44, 45, he is responsible for so many so many Czech people to, to go away and have to undertake forced labor. So even if he's not the one carrying out the, the, the killings or whatever himself, he is more than enabling it. You know, he has blood on his hands. Absolutely. Um, maybe my last question, um, for, for at this point of the, of the discussion, um, please, Daniel, is if you could reflect maybe on the descendants of Griesinger and how some way they connect to you and your family. It's, you know, if the book wasn't intriguing enough and if the audience hadn't already been completely consumed with the fascinating details that you've shared, um, there is a whole personal journey for you as well and a personal intersection. Um, so maybe if you could just share a little bit of that. Thank you. Sure. So one of, one of the most again, uh, remarkable moments for me as the historian in this book was, you know, I hadn't ever expected that I would in any way, my family would be involved in this story. You know, I'm a professional historian. I don't, I'm not writing about myself here. But at one point in the story, you know, I knew that my, my maternal grandmother, her father had come to London from Ukraine at the beginning of the 20th century. I knew which part of Ukraine, I knew the name of the shtetl, et cetera. But what was amazing was when I got out this enormous map of 
uh, Ukraine in 1941, and I just started putting pins in every part of Griesinger's route, that out of the whole of Ukraine, which is the biggest, largest country in Europe, that he actually, his unit actually marched through the shtetl from which my family came from, you know, which was, you know, I had never expected that. So that's, in, in July 1941, his, it was pouring with rain, it was a terrible month, uh, and his unit actually spent five days uh, in that town um, called Stavisha, which is not too far from Kiev, about two hours uh, south of Kiev. And again, he, he would have seen relative, you know, distant relatives, of course. He would have like seen the sights, the, heard the sounds that my family would have encountered over generations. So again, this, this, this aspect of Griesinger in, in, bizarrely actually led me to doing a lot more research about that part of my family history and to discover exactly what had happened to those relatives who hadn't been so fortunate as to come to Britain at the beginning of the 20th century and who had remained behind. Amazing, and I remember, uh, I know that you mentioned that your grandmother had been, um, shared some of those stories when you were growing up. So you had some sense of the history prior to even doing further research. It's amazing. And um, I'm going to hand over to Tally, but I do want to just say that uh, talking to you, Daniel, I'm sure that uh, the audience are getting a fair sense of what I mean when I say that the book is accessible. The way you um, describe the anecdotes and share a little bit of your journey is exactly how you write. And it is um, certainly a very worthwhile read. So I'm going to ask my friend and colleague, Tally Nates, who you know well, to take over and because I see the chat is filling up. Thank you so much for the beginning part. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you, Daniel. Let me show everyone the book. Uh, I managed to get it at Exclusive Bookshop, and uh, it is, as Mary said, absolutely a wonderful read. Um, Daniel, there are a few other photos uh, in the, uh, 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 that we can share, and some of the questions from, from the audience actually will allow Claudia to share some more photos. So maybe, um, maybe we can start by, uh, by Karen Kadish's uh, 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 question about what interaction did Griesinger have with Jewish people throughout his life? So maybe you can tell some and then Claudia can share uh, the one picture of the Rothschilds. Sure. No, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And I'm, I'm able to answer it thanks to, um, thanks to this photograph, actually, which Claudia is going to show us in a moment. Um, so, okay, so one of the, um, uh, one of the, what's the word I'm looking for? Advantages, perhaps, of me writing about this book was, th this subject was, cause, was that Griesinger came from Stuttgart, which is somewhere I didn't really know anything about before stumbling upon it. He, I'd never really thought much about, you know, the, what had happened in the Holocaust. There's so much history that I'd read of the Third Reich had happened either in, you know, Berlin or Frankfurt or Munich. Stuttgart wasn't a city I had ever had much to do with. So it was a lot of, it was really interesting learning so much about this new place. He, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a city, it wasn't um, small by any means, but the Jewish population was very small. So even though he was born in Stuttgart, a town that probably had about 400,000 people, uh, there was no more than say 5,000 Jews in that town um, at the time. The first sort of semblance I had of any sort of ill feeling towards the Jews was actually from looking at Griesinger's mother's diary. That's when I found she was, a, she was a, an avid collector of newspaper articles. So she would always cut out and mark with red pen articles that caught her eye. And often some of the most anti-Semitic um, articles of the day, she, she would keep and she would sort of, as you can see here, she would like tag them into her diary um, using a paperclip and she would sometimes like write her opinions on them. So that's when I got a sense of sort of the background, the anti-Semitism, um, which would have been very normal uh, for him, the, the milieu in which he grew up. He went to a very, very good school in Stuttgart. There were about, I think, um, 500, 600 pupils, all boys at his school. 
And of those school children, there was about 20 Jews. So not that many, but nevertheless, he did have a Jewish boy in his class. Uh, there was one Jewish boy in the class. It was very easy to identify. I was able to go to the archives and find the list, the register of all the boys in his class. And next to everybody's name, it said the religion. So it was very easy to know. It was always easy to know who would have been the Jewish kid or the Protestant kid or the Catholic kid um, at his school. Um, at university, so again, actually, Claudia, maybe just show that picture of them fencing at university. There's, he joined this extremely right-wing university, Tübingen, which did not have Jewish students. It didn't have any Jewish faculty. And on his, he, he was very eager to join one of these dueling societies, these fraternities where, you know, they, they swore allegiance to uh, creating this new nationalist, anti-Jewish, anti-communist uh, German system. Um, he, I mean, in a photo, the whole point of the, the scar on his face, which I saw from the very first picture of him, was that this is where he would have obtained his scar. He would have, you know, the very first occasion that the, that the, the, the knife, the, the sword would have slashed his flesh, he would have reached for the salt and poured salt into the wound to make him appear more manly. It was very, very important to him. Anyway, I feel I'm digressing here with the question. The point is, is that at Tübingen, he wouldn't have come across Jewish people, but boy, would he have been involved in a very deeply anti-Semitic uh, environment. So by the time, what, what, I mean, the, the, one of the only moments in this book where I was totally speechless was when I discovered that his next door neighbor, while he was working at the Gestapo, was Jewish and was, uh, there was a Jewish family next door called Rothschild. And this just took me completely by surprise. I had no idea that he had ever lived uh, in such close proximity uh, to a Jewish family. I wanted to visit the house because, you know, I had the two addresses, but it wasn't clear to me whether or not the two houses were maybe, I don't know, uh, 100 meters apart or whether they were right next door to each other. So when I went to the house and the current owners showed me around, uh, very kindly, I was able to see that, you know, the two houses were joined together by a wall. He could have, you know, easily, it, there was no mistaking that the front doors were a couple of meters apart. When I tracked down the Rothschild's granddaughter, they were able to tell me the level of um, sort of religious life that her grandparents had led. They she told me that, they, of course, they would have had a mezuzah, they would have lit the candles on Shabbat. These are all kinds of Jewish life that Griesinger would have seen on his doorstep um, every day uh, as a lawyer. I was able then to you know, find out, I tell a parallel story in the book about what actually became of this couple, how both of them managed to escape after Kristallnacht uh, Stuttgart. They tried to stay as long as possible. Someone like Fritz Rothschild, who we see in this picture, you know, an old veteran from World War I, for someone like him, you know, the Nazis, anti-Semitism, this kind of thing has been and come and gone in the past a hundred times. It's just going to go away. I'm a World War I veteran. Look at my medals. You know, this isn't going to affect someone like me. So he stayed in, in Germany much longer than a lot of his relatives. He left right after Kristallnacht in November 1938 and went to France. And he and his wife and son lived in France until 1944, until, at which point they were deported uh, to Auschwitz. And then later, um, in uh, Nazi-occupied Prague, again, Griesinger moves to this area, this very, this, this beautiful suburb of Prague, where again, almost every single house had once been owned by a Jewish family in this district, all of whom, by the time Griesinger arrived in 1943, had already been deported to Theresienstadt. So he did have, he, you know, he, he was interacting with Jews quite a lot throughout his life. Thank you so much. Um, so maybe we're going back now to, to um, you shared quite a lot about the racism, anti-Semitism, conservative upbringing. Bob, Bob McCormick, that is joining us from the United States, uh, is asking, can you elaborate in, a little bit about the connection to the southern US and what did you find out? Can you tell us more about that? 
Um, well, if, if Bob wants to type a bit more specifically, I can try to answer his question, but I'll try, you know, while he's typing, I'll try and say a word or two. Um, so what I found amazing, actually going into Griesinger's house today, the family, where, where the family still lives, it was the same house in which he had grown up, was the way in which it really looked like one of these southern plantations from the late 19th century. I was always interested in the history of the chair itself. That's what got me going on this research. I wanted to know everything about this one armchair. I wanted to know how much it had cost, who was its intended buyer, who, what sort of, you know, uh, who, it, who, the tastes of the person to whom it would appeal, where it had been made, all these kinds of questions. So it was really, really striking to me to go to his house and see all of this big furniture you know, this was typical of the kind of furniture that Griesinger would have grown up with, the kind of furniture he would have had at home. I wanted to know, was this furniture, did it ever be belong to a Jewish family? Like so much of the, of, the, um, of the furniture in Prague, which had been seized from Jewish families in France, the Netherlands and Belgium, and later shipped east to either replenish German families who had been bombed or to put in the offices of uh, in these new cities, these new Nazi places like uh, Warsaw or Prague. So I really wanted to know everything I could about this chair. And the more I saw the house in Stuttgart, the more I saw the influence of the American South, this big furniture, you know, something like a teeny tiny armchair would have been totally, uh, it didn't fit his, his, his world, his, his imaginary, somebody like, um, Robert Griesinger, he was used to this big, uh, this, this style of furnishings. And I think what's interesting about this is the way in which so many ideas or influences, you know, the effect these had on him and they came from North America, they came from the American South. And that's something we often forget as historians. You know, we often think of the way Europe influenced America and so many Europeans would travel to America. But we often don't talk about that so many thousands, th hundreds of thousands actually didn't like America or decided to move back to Europe in the late 19th century. And they took with them lots of ideas about either in this case furniture, but often ideas about race, racial thinking, um, and all sorts of things. And, you know, this was extremely powerful for someone like Griesinger. His influences about race, about, all, you know, anything in his life didn't just come from Germany. They were heavily influenced from America. And Bob is actually uh, elaborating as you asked him, and he said, would you feel that exposure to American racism, Jim Crow laws, the KKK, that his family was familiar with, would have made his progression with the SS uh, likelier or easier? Can you make some connections? No, to I mean, look, you don't need to have relatives in the American South to have been a Nazi. OK, <laughs> so, you know, that I'm not saying in any way that, oh, you know, th there's a some kind of teleology here. But boy, can we see a, a huge influence on the fact that, for example, the 1870s. So what we see after the American Civil War, after this period of intense reconstruction, economic downturn, we see huge racism in 1870s New Orleans, more so than you know, at an extreme scale, lynchings taking place all over the state at the beginning of the 1870s. And just from looking into his family, the kind of relationships they had, who they mixed with, I can see very clearly how involved they were with some of these figures from 1870s New Orleans and what kind of ideas these people had on race and, um, and, 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 and such, you know, racist outlook, racist vision of the world. So for somebody like Griesinger, this, it kind of, it, it sort of, there's this coalescence. It, it really does chime with how he thinks about the world. So much, uh, so much of it chimes, sorry, with, with this German anti-Semitism. You know, this, the, so you have on the one hand, the US influence coming from the South, and then you have, the, you know, the, the German anti-Semitism from late 19th century Germany. And the two for him are very easily, easily compatible for him to form his, his, his sort of worldview on race.
in different so maybe, as well. Yeah, so maybe develop it further a little bit about he is not a Nazi. Uh, the family is conservative, right wing. What, so why is he becoming an SS? Why is he joining the Nazis? Maybe make the connections from a right wing to becoming national socialist. It's not a big jump for someone like him and for someone of his background. He probably didn't vote for Hitler in 1933. He came from this such a right wing, such a conservative, such a nationalist, anti-Semitic, anti-communist family. And in the southwest of Germany, where he came from, so again, this area which hasn't always been explored as well as it might have by historians, you know, Nazism just didn't take hold in the same way as it did in other parts of Germany. It took a very, it took much longer in this part for, uh, for mem you know, Nazi rallies to take place so that they would be big audiences and things like that. So I'm not saying in any way that the people who, who in that area were necessarily averse to Nazism, but my point really is that there were so many other organizations, political parties that existed there unique to that area or, or other sort of movements that, that had the same sort of racial sort of thinking, but weren't necessarily the Nazis. He had his pick of, of racist or right-wing uh, nationalist anti-Semitic organizations. And for someone like Riesinger, he wouldn't necessarily have been attracted to the Nazis. Like I said, he's got this PhD in law. He's from a military background. For him, it probably it would have taken a lot longer for him, as we see, to get involved with this Nazi, uh, with the Nazi bandwagon. So, so Peter Houston is asking an interesting question. What lessons are the uh, Griesinger worldview on race and the contemporary rise of anti-Semitism, for example, today, or nationalism or racism? So maybe if you can make some connections. Yeah, I think a lot of this is obviously a hot topic at the moment. We see this rise of nationalism everywhere at the moment. And I think that what I tried to do in this book is to make us really think, well, hold on a minute. It's not just those people at the top that are in any way, you know, that are in entirely responsible. We can't just keep looking at the same leaders at the moment, perhaps in the world, the same one or two people, um, or the same historical uh, individuals. It's very easy to fixate on these people. Um, and their personalities. And I think what's more interesting is to look at who are these people underneath, the people that enable these people, the people that sort of gave voice and supported these people. I think these are the questions that future historians will be asking about today, about, you know, the people that did support uh, various movements and, and allow such things to take place. That's what I hope uh, a lot of readers uh, take away from, from, from this book moving the focus away from the people at the top, just to see how things do function uh, at a mass level. I think Tally is momentarily uh, dealing with load shedding and going to rejoin on, a, on a, a different device. So I would just, there's been quite a number of questions around why did Griesinger hide the documents in the chair. And just to give a sense of um, the circumstances in which he found himself and required him to. So thank you, if you wouldn't mind. Of course, and this is something, of course, I, I talk about a lot in the book. So I hope, I do hope people find some of what I write about on this subject interesting. I can, I say a lot more about it there. But the, so, so Griesinger's family had left Prague in, the, in, in the beginning of spring 1945, just as the Americans and the Russians were sort of about to, to enter, um, they had fled to be in Liechtenstein, where Griesinger's in-laws lived, his, his wife's parents. Um, so he was by himself. It was May 1945. He was in Prague, just as, you know, the Russians, the Czech partisans, the, the, the American allies were, were about to take over the city. 
And what we see from this time is the total, uh, the danger uh, that would have existed for ordinary Germans who found themselves still in the city at that time, those who hadn't fled. What, some of the pictures, even some of the videos which we still see on YouTube, it is after six years of, of, of brutal, horrific Nazi occupation, the people of Prague really decided to, uh, many people decided to take their revenge on their former oppressors. So for this sort of period of beginning of, to mid-May 1945 in Prague, we see time and time again instances of Germans, anyone, it, you didn't even need to be wearing a uniform. It was sometimes people who just spoke with a German accent. People would be rounded up, they would be taken to special centers, there, would, there, were, there was um, evidence of torture taking place against uh, German civilians at that time. It was a, uh, the, the Red Cross had closed its doors um, to Germans. It was a very dangerous time to be a German in, in Prague in May 1945. And that's really the context in which, that's the last, uh, the last time he was seen at home was on the 5th of May 1945 at his house. Hello from dark, uh, dark Johannesburg. I'm on the phone now. <laughs> Just now, the you know the generator will come and suddenly there will be light. But uh, yeah, Tally, you're back. So we had one question um, that Daniel just responded um, yeah. around you. why the chair, why the why the documents were hidden, and it's back to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I'm sorry. It's uh, the joys of living in. Uh, in this time in, uh, in uh, South Africa. Um, perhaps uh, another question that, that came up uh, privately um, to me was, he is a lawyer. He is, uh, you, you mentioned before uh, that he was in Stuttgart in the Gestapo. What would he do as a lawyer that is connected to the uh, persecution of targeted groups, for example? Did he have, do you think, um, uh, perhaps connections to legislation against Jews? Or it, was he involved in the Holocaust in that legal side of things? I mean, there's no doubt about it. His, um, so his, his PhD in law actually looked at the history of um, usury this very sort of, you know, a term which is often connected with anti-Semitism and then uh, with Jews and with anti-Semitism. And then later, by the time we see him as a lawyer in Stuttgart in the mid 1930s at the Gestapo, a lot of what he's doing is making sure that the Nazi anti-Semitic laws conceived and put into place in Berlin are actually being enacted locally. It's very important that the message gets out, not just in the city of Stuttgart, but he's responsible for the whole region. So sometimes I would find documents that he had sent personally to a tiny little village in the middle of nowhere, you know, 40 miles away from Stuttgart, uh, where there's probably like one or two Jews at the most. Yet nevertheless, it was very important to him that various local officials knew about every single piece of anti-Semitic legislation that was being put out, and he wanted to make sure that they were be it was being implemented across his state. I'm not sure if you're still there, Tally. I'm wondering too. Um, Debbie Bags asked, "How do his daughters feel about the book?" And seeing as though it was a seek, oh, sorry, I'm just going to read her question. Okay. Um, Seeing as though there was a secret in the family and that there was, you know, they weren't, it was the unspoken and not to be spoken about. How did they feel about the book now that it's published? An interesting question too. Definitely. No, it was something that I was obviously quite worried about, uh, how, how they were going to respond to this and given how generous they were with me. Um, but they've responded extremely positively. You know, I've, I, I made sure to send them the book uh, long before it was published, so that they had their own copy of it. Um, and I think it's sort of given them, 
you know, they're, they're learning stuff from it. I feel that I get emails from them or messages from them. They, they read it in chunks. They read, they, they, uh, you know, they probably read it once all the way through and, and now they keep revisiting it because it's, for them, it's often, you know, I'm, as one of the daughters uh, tells me often, you know, I'm giving her back a piece of her past because she doesn't know so much about her father. You know, it's sort of like she'll take something in, she'll go for a walk and she'll read a little bit more. So I think that they've, they've reacted in a very, very positively. Um, look, it was always going to be difficult to, to be told so much of this stuff that I reveal here in the book. Um, uh, so I think it has been hard for them on, on, on some levels, but at no point have they ever asked, said like, oh, you know, don't publish, or I, I, I don't want my family to be raked through the mud here uh, in a way that, you know, would be understandable you know, in, in various contexts, you know, if our parents or grandparents had committed certain acts, however big or however small even, it's very, uh, I would have totally understood if they had sort of not wanted me to push ahead with this book. I think we'll take one last question because some people have had to drop off with this load shedding new schedule at eight o'clock. So Daniel, there's a, a Debbie bag saying, how did he die? And is he really dead? You mentioned he was last seen in 1945. <laughs> so on that sort of uh, uh, note in terms of intrigue and um, we'll yeah. ask you to just share what thoughts you'd like to and then I'll say the final closing remarks. Yeah, no, again, thank you. I can, look, he is highly likely he's dead. He was born in 1906. So we're thinking, you know, 100 and, well, his birthday's November, so 113 minimum. Uh, but look, it's my evidence um, points to the fact that he died in September, on the tw 27th of September, 1945 in Prague. So there was a period between May and September where he was missing. And I talk about this in the book about where he was. In September, he dies in a hospital. We know he dies uh, in a hospital from various documents, which I won't go into now. But what's interesting is the way in which his family heard about his death compared to what the archives tell us about his death. The family had always heard that he was killed in hospital in Prague in 1945. Whereas the archives paint a picture of somebody who had uh, contracted a disease in September 1945. Um, what is very interesting as a historian is, is, the, is to, how, you know, to think a little bit about these two stories and how they might marry up uh, together. We know that in September, it, it, throughout spring and summer 1945, various attacks took place against Germans in hospital in Prague. We know stories, for example, of Red Army officers or Czech partisans taking a German uh, patient to the top floor, to the roof of the hospital, while other uh, Red Army officers were at the bottom on, uh, with their guns pointing upwards and the patient would be thrown off the roof. And it was a sort of competition to see whether the patient would die by hitting the ground or whether any of the people at the bottom would be able to shoot him uh, with bullets before he managed to hit the ground. This was happening regularly at that time, attacks against Germans in hospitals. Yet never is anything like this reported in newspapers, nor is it reported in official death certificate records. So somebody who was, you know, treated very badly, who was murdered in a hospital, it would be written typhus. I'm not saying this happened every single time. Of course not. They're what we know that the, the level of disease that existed in time. My point is that so many people who were um, murdered in hospital, there is no written evidence of that. So uh, those are the two theories we're going to go with. We know that he died in Prague in September 1945. I managed to find his grave. Um, and again, I write about this um, quite at some length in the book. Thank you so, so much, Daniel. What a thrilling conversation. And I'm sure that everybody's going to be waiting at exclusive books when they open tomorrow to really get to start to understand, as you said, how one ordinary person can have such a fascinating and dark um, 
history and how you've taken so much time, care, trouble as a historian to provide us with these stories of, ordin of an ordinary man. So thank you so much. The um, webinar, as we mentioned, has been recorded. We'll share the recording with everybody. It's been wonderful to see you all, both Johannesburg and Durban Holocaust and Genocide Centers have events in the coming days. So look out for our adverts. And we look forward to seeing you all again. Welcome back, Tally. Thank you so much for joining us and um, stay safe, stay out of trouble in the dark. And uh, thank you very, very much. Particularly thank you to Daniel. There's lots and lots of comments in the chat. Thank you so much from many people in the US, from all other places. And we'll send you all the comments. And, um, but just be assured that we've thoroughly enjoyed your perspective, your journey. And thank you for writing this incredible book. It was such an honor. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I do hope one day to come and visit in person. I really, really hope so. Sooner than later, hopefully. We look forward to that very, very much. Absolutely. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Daniel, and thank you to everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.